Hi, I'm Jared Gardner, and today we are going to talk about malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, or MPNST for short. Uh, what you're seeing right here is one of the classic histologic features of MPNST. This is called the herringbone pattern, and this is a pattern that's seen in lots of different uh, sarcomas. Historically, it was used to describe fibrosarcoma. We rarely ever use that term in modern soft tissue pathology. I'll do a video about that topic another day. I'm going to talk for just a minute about uh, some of the main features uh, clinically uh, of MPNST, but I'm going to leave this picture right here so you can burn into your mind while I'm talking what herringbone pattern looks like. It's these fascicles right here that are intersecting at sharp angles and kind of look like there are ridges of cells coming up out of the slide at you. It reminds me of that kind of in the 1990s there were these seeing eye um, uh, puzzles. If you crossed your eyes it would make it look three-dimensional. And it's okay to make that reference in this video because it's already like you know almost 30 years ago. So it's already dated. So uh, it's okay to do that and it shows that I'm old. So anyway, let's talk about MPNST. These are rare sarcomas that are usually high grade and they arise classically in one of three settings, okay? Either it's a sarcoma arising in a nerve, that's number one. Number two, a sarcoma arising in a neurofibroma or rarely other types of benign nerve sheath tumors like schwannoma, very rarely though. Or number three, a sarcoma arising in a patient with neurofibromatosis type one. So a sarcoma in a nerve, in a neurofibroma, or in an NF1 patient, that is MPNST unless proven otherwise. There are other examples, for, for ex instance, I've seen synovial sarcoma arise within a nerve and it was proven by molecular. So uh, that doesn't prove it by itself, but those, those three um, scenarios are classic. Outside of those three things, if you have a sarcoma that you think is MPNST, but it's, there's no background nerve that it's coming from, either radiographically, clinically, or histologically, there's no neurofibroma area next to it, the patient does not have NF1, in that setting, be careful of making a firm diagnosis of MPNST. What you have to do in that setting is use a constellation of histologic features, which we're gonna talk about in a second, and also, um, you can add some immunohistochemical support to that, although there's no perfect stain for MPNST. And putting those things together, you can uh, either be suggestive of MPNST or sometimes can firmly arrive at that diagnosis. All right, clinically, about half of MPNSTs arise in patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. All right. 10% arise in the setting of post-radiation therapy after a patient's been irradiated for some other tumor, and then later, years down the road, they develop an MPNST. Um, other sarcomas, like angiosarcoma, of course, and other types of sarcomas can arise um, status post-radiation as well. And then the remainder, about 40% or so, are sporadic. They just happen randomly and don't have um, any known uh, risk factor in the background that would predispose the patient to developing MPNST. Um, the age range for these, they can occur kind of at any range, or excuse me, at any age, but young to middle-aged adults are probably the most common group that are afflicted between 20 to 50 years of age. And it can occur in kids occasionally, uh, not common, but it, I have seen a few cases. And patients with neurofibromatosis type 1, when they get MPNST, they tend to get it at a younger age than patients with sporadic MPNST. Now, unfortunately, the prognosis is poor for these tumors, uh, at least for high-grade MPNSTs. Low-grade MPNST is kind of a separate topic, and, and some people have suggested maybe we don't even use that name because it behaves differently, probably, than high-grade MPNST. Um, but, uh, and I'll put a link in the video below, actually, on that topic of, of uh, low-grade tumors in the setting of NF1. And also, you can watch my video on neurofibromatosis and neurofibromas and learn a little bit more about that um, topic. But anyway, the, the prognosis for high-grade MPNST is poor, they're aggressive tumors, and um, unfortunately in the setting of NF1 they tend to have an even worse prognosis than those that occur sporadically. So uh, it's a serious diagnosis and I mean any high-grade sarcoma is a serious diagnosis, but in particular because these have such a poor prognosis and such aggressive behavior, um, it's important to not make the diagnosis lightly. All right, here's another imp important point clinically. These are usually large, deep tumors not small superficial cutaneous tumors, okay? MPNST almost always arises at a large, as a large mass in deep soft tissue. It is extremely rare in the skin. I have seen, I think, one case ever, and I made that diagnosis only very grudgingly after ruling out every other possibility. And there have been a limited number of cases of cutaneous MPNST described in the literature, but they are extremely rare, and I think um, you should really, unless you're a soft tissue expert, 
don't make that diagnosis without expert consultation would be my opinion. I, like I said, the one time I saw it, I only made the diagnosis with, with great fear and trepidation because I really just uh, have a hard time accepting MPNST in the skin in most cases, okay? So um, it's been reported, it can happen, but it's really rare and you should be really cautious. The biggest problem I see is that people will often see a spindle tumor that's ugly and S100 positive and it's in the skin and they'll say, I think it's MPNST. And almost always those end up being spindle cell melanomas that have just lost ex expression of uh, MART1 or HMB45 or their other um, specific markers. We'll talk more about immunostains in a minute. So they're usually large deep masses, the extremities um, most commonly, also the trunk or the, even the head and neck. The sciatic nerve is one of the most common sites and in the setting of NF1 they typically arise out of the midst of those large deep plexiform neurofibromas. So either what they'll see is a patient has a large plexiform neurofibroma that suddenly has an area that starts, an area of nodularity that grows into a big mass rapidly, and or on PET CT scan, there's an area that develops a hot, you know, uptake, high uptake or a hot nodule on uh, in the midst of a plexiform neurofibroma. So in the setting of NF1, that's the kind of scenario. And uh, it can be challenging, especially if you're asked to do a frozen section uh, in this setting because you know the plexiform neurofibroma will be huge and the MPNST might be a, a, a smaller area or only a portion of the plexiform neurofibroma. So finding the right area to sample can be challenging. All right, and again, back to the thing about skin, I forgot to mention one point. Even in NF1 patients who have somewhere around a 10% risk of developing MPNST over their lifespan, and sometimes have hundreds of neurofibromas on their skin surface. Even in that setting, we almost never see MPNST arising in the skin, in the cutaneous neurofibromas. Even in NF1 patients who have a predisposition and numerous neurofibromas on their skin, it still just almost never happens. So again, a strong caution against um, making a diagnosis of MPNST in the skin unless you're absolutely sure. Okay, let's finally finish with me talking. I just needed to set those background points, but let's talk about the different histologic features, okay? So the histologic features, again, there's no one feature that makes a diagnosis of MPNST. It's a constellation. It's a uh, multiple different features put together, and then you can add in the clinical setting if you have it, and also some immunohistochemical findings for support. The most, I think, most prominent feature is the fascicular growth. These are spindled cells that are hyperchromatic and atypical, they're often relatively uniform, but they have more pleomorphism than you would see in, uh, say, a synovial sarcoma, for example. And if you haven't seen my video on synovial sarcoma, you can go and check that out. I'll put a link in the upper right-hand uh, corner. All right, so the, these hyperchromatic spindle cells are arranged in fascicles, and the fascicles off, often have this kind of sharply intersecting angle, as opposed to, say, the, the 90 degree orientation of the fascicles in a smooth muscle tumor. These are sharply angulated, and people compare them to the, the bones, um, the, the bones coming off the vertebrae of a fish, the herring bone or fish bone or chevron pattern, whichever visual term you like. And you can see it's real distinct. You can describe it a lot of ways, but once you've seen the herringbone pattern, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's herringbone. Other areas are not quite as herringbone, but are nicely fascicular. You can see all of the nuclei streaming together here in fascicles. Going to lower power, you can sometimes uh, visualize it more clearly. And you can see it's, it's uh, variable. Some areas are really fascicular and herringbone. Other, kind of, other areas get more sheet-like or get real broad fascicles. Some pleomorphism is present, but it's usually, uh, again, less uh, dramatic than the pleomorphism in um, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or other forms of high-grade pleomorphic adult sarcomas, okay? But definitely there is almost always more nuclear pleomorphism and nuclear atypia in MPNST than you would see in synovial sarcoma. And that's because there are a variety probably of molecular abnormalities going on here in, in MPNST. But in synovial sarcoma, you have one main molecular abnormality, and that's the translocation of SS18 and the SSX genes. And uh, translocation sarcomas tend to be very uniform rather than pleomorphic, all right? So the, the fascicular pattern is really helpful, and cytologically, sometimes the cells will have kind of a Schwann cell look. They'll have kind of buckled or curved, or if you like the term wavy, it's not my favorite term, but um, S-shaped, serpentine. There's lots of different words for Schwann cells, and if you, if you check out my neurofibroma video also, I talk about 
um, uh, what Schwann cells look like cytologically. Sometimes you'll see Schwannian cytologic features, but a lot of times you won't. A lot of times you'll just see these kind of spindle to oval cells and they're arranged in fascicles. So I think that usually it's the, the histologic architecture that's the more helpful feature in recognizing MPNST uh, rather than cytology. Although when the cytology works uh, and looks Schwannian, then that's great, okay? So the herringbone pattern of uh, fat and fascicular uh, growth pattern, really helpful feature for uh, MPNST. Here's another case, not quite as hyperchromatic. It's maybe a little bit more faded and looks a little more pink. So you could think about a smooth muscle tumor maybe at first, but again, look at these fascicles. They're not really running at 90 degree angles. They're really sharply intersecting with one another. So this is again, just a kind of different variation on the herringbone. Look at that, look at how sharply they, they're arranged together. I sometimes try to think about what would this look like in three dimensions, but it's kind of too complex for my, my simple two dimensional mind to, to imagine. Um, in any case though, this is a really nice example of a fascicular pattern. And remember, for, for those of you who are beginning at pathology, herringbone pattern is just a subtype of fascicular pattern. It's when the fascicles are arranged together in these really, uh, these really you know, kind of acute angles or these rows that look almost um, like they're coming up out of the slide at you. So another example of, of the herringbone pattern uh, right here, a really good example of it. And there's a little bit of necrosis in the background, which is often seen in MPNST. We'll see more examples of that in a minute. Now here's a very different looking MPNST, and we're not gonna focus as much on the cells here. We're gonna focus on the low power on these zones of necrosis. This is a common feature in MPNST necrosis, sometimes abundant necrosis. And when you get the necrosis, it's so abundant that the zonal necrosis kind of become confluent with, with one another, and they make kind of a sea of death, basically. Just, just a zone of dead and dying cells, these pink, pink areas of dying cells, the nuclei are starting to, to wash out and dissolve. And interestingly, in the midst of this necrosis, there are these little islands of viable cells, and each island is centered around a blood vessel. And that kind of makes sense, right? That as the tumor outgrows its blood supply, the, the zones, uh, the areas of tumor farthest away from the feeding blood vessels lose oxygen and get ischemic and necrotic and die. And the areas of cells right around the vessels um, are the closest to the oxygenation, the closest to the blood source. So they tend to, to live. At least that's my understanding of why this might happen, or at least that's my theory. And this pattern has been termed the perithelioomatous pattern. And, and I wondered what that, what that actually meant for a long time. And so it's an old timey word from the early 1900s that basically just means perivascular, okay? Because the endothelium lines the vessels. And so the thought was that the perithelium is the area around the outside of the vessel. So it's kind of an old timey word from the early 1900s that sounds real fancy. So you can try that out at your next cocktail party and see what your friends think about the word perithelioomatous. If you want to make friends, don't do that. They, they won't like it unless they're pathologists. Okay, so islands of viable cells in a sea of death, geographic necrosis we call this, the little islands are the geography, and the background necrosis is kind of the oceans in between, and, um, and that's a common feature. Other tumors can have this, but it's a really common finding in, in MPNST. So again, this is another, if you're looking for a constellation to make MPNST, the, herring, the fascicles are one star in the constellation. The, fa the herringbone arrangement of the fascicles is another star. These zones of necrosis with islands of perithelioomatous viable tumor, that's another star in the constellation, okay? So you're adding all these things up to kind of get to the diagnosis of MPNST. Let's look closer around these vessels. Something unusual and strange happens oftentimes. Let's see, maybe I'll have to go away a little bit here. This will work. Around the vessels in MPNST, in addition to the retained viable cells, you um, also have, i try to get it right in the center of the screen. you have a strange change in the tumor cells directly adjacent to the vessels, okay? And this is a little different than those islands of viable tumor. What you have here is that the, the, the tumor cells right around the vessel start getting larger and almost more epithelioid. They get larger and more round and they cluster and accentuate right around each vessel. And I'm not sure why this exactly happens, if there's some sort of growth factor here that's, that's causing this or what. But the tumor cells, you can see they're very atypical here. I don't know if I can get the light right. Very atypical cells, and they're, they're not the endothelial cells, although you can have weird reactive endothelial change sometimes. 
in these uh, in the vessels of MPNST, but the tumor cells themselves around the vessels cluster up and get kind of more atypical and larger and more rounded right around the vessels. And I'll show that I've got several cases here where you can see that really nicely. Here's another example. See these large cells kind of accentuating around vessels. So this is a curious phenomenon that, that often occurs in MPNST and I don't see it very often in other tumors. Here actually right in, the, in this area, in the periotheliomatous area, you can see it too. You can see more rounded, uh, enlarged tumor cells clustering around the vessel. Same thing right over here. So it's a curious finding, and I, I find that a really helpful clue. Dr. Weiss taught me this in fellowship, and, and I, after doing sarcoma pathology now for, for several years, I've not seen this very often in very many other tumors. So it's, a, I think, a really nice clue, not totally specific, but a real helpful clue to the diagnosis of MPNST. Now here's another one that I want to look at from the low power mainly. And look at the variability um, in the cellularity for one thing. Number one, this area is more cellular, hypercellular. And then out here is really quite hypocellular. We've got some probably some zonal necrosis right there too. So you have a, and then even more cellular over here. So this heterogeneity of cellularity, this um, uh, hyper and hypocellular areas that often kind of swirl together, um, that's a really helpful uh, feature for MPNST. And the other thing is over here, you can see the background has this pale blue look, and this is um, a mixoid background, a ground substance or hyaluronic acid, glycosaminoglycans, whatever names you like, are often present in uh, benign nerve sheath tumors and malignant nerve sheath tumors. Neurofibromas often have a mixoid background. Malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors do as well. So the mixoid background is a helpful finding for MPNST. Again, not totally specific. Lots of tumors can have mixoid change, but again, it's another star in the constellation. It's another point in favor of MPNST, especially when you already have all the other stuff we just talked about. Now, you don't have to have each of these features I'm talking about here. I would say that many MPNSTs only have a subset of these features, but it's good to keep them in mind that when you start seeing these things, especially two or three of these different features we've talked about, then you can really start thinking about, could this be MPNST? And even if you can't get there definitively, you could potentially raise it in the differential. And when I'm not sure, that's what I'll say. I'll say high-grade sarcoma, and there are features morphologically suggestive of MPNST, but I'm not really sure that either the immunostains are are not quite supportive or, or there's no, no background neurofibroma or the patient doesn't have NF1. I'll put some caveat in there if I'm not sure. So this mixoid background and uh, the blending of hyper and hypocellular areas is really helpful. And sometimes these areas kind of swirl together and blend. And so there's a term called marbling for that. These hypocellular, often mixoid areas, kind of marbling or swirling or whirling together, blending into the more cellular zones. Okay, and this is a common feature again in MPNST. And we've seen it in a few other cases, but dilated blood vessels by themselves, that's a, a common feature. And we can see that in lots of different uh, sarcomas, synovial sarcoma has dilated vessels, um, solitary fibrous tumors, which kind of are in that intermediate zone where some behave malignantly and some don't, they have dilated vessels. Lots of tumors have dilated uh, branching vessels, or, or sometimes we call them when they're branching, we call them hemangioparasitic vessels after the, the old name for solitary fibrous tumor, which used to be called hemangioparasitoma. But the dilated vessels are helpful. Again, we've got zones of necrosis in here. And this is a really good example of the perivascular enlargement of cells and accentuation of cellularity around the vessels. Look at these, this vessel right here, this kind of a curved vessel we're cutting at, a, at an angle. There's a little vessel here that we're just about to cut into. Up here's a vessel and look what we see. You can see a dramatic increase in cellularity and in the size of the individual tumor cells right around those vessels. So again, look at that. We've seen this in a couple cases now and we'll see it again before the video is done. That's the picture right there to keep in your mind. When you start seeing that in a sarcoma, start thinking about MPNST. And of course, mark, mark nuclear atypia, hyperchromasia, mitotic figures in the background. When I think, let's see if we can get it on the video. This is a, a curious little feature that we see in 
uh, and euploid tumors sometimes. And I learned this actually on Twitter from the Johns Hopkins uh, Twitter account, the Johns Hopkins GI Twitter account. The, this is an anaphase bridge. As the mitotic figure is separating, it leaves a little strand, a little wisp of chromatin kind of torn between the two halves. And this is a sign of, of probably of aneuploidy of a non a non-even number of chromosomes that are present there. And because of that, the cell when it tries to, when the mitosis tries to divide along the mitotic spindle, it's not able to pull apart correctly, and so a portion gets kind of stretched out and left in the middle. And this is, again, all atypical mitotic figures, um, this is a sign of, of aneuploidy, of multiple chromosomal gains and losses. So this uh, anaphase bridge, this is not a, a specific feature of MPNST, it's just a thing that we see in a lot of different um, uh, high-grade um, aneuploid tumors. And uh, I just thought it was interesting to point out because I just happened to see it. Let's see, can we get it in focus better here? Probably not. There, you can kind of see, it's almost like a little tornado or something. I don't know, maybe my imagination is too vivid some days. All right, so that's a, again, that kind of a perivascular condensation of uh, large atypical cells common for MPNST. And I know I'm showing a lot of cases, but I think it's good to show the range of features you can see in MPNST and also the, the fact that even across the different tumors and the different features they might have, there are similarities that are retained between them. And once you start to recognize those, um, you can begin to recognize MPNST. And these are, again, I see them on a regular basis because I'm a sarcoma pathologist, but these are rare tumors and this is part of why sarcoma pathology is particularly challenging because it's hard to get experience and see enough cases to get a good feel for the range of features that you can see in different sarcomas because they're so rare. And again, this obviously is just an example of that dramatic geographic necrosis, the sea of death with islands of viable cells surrounding individual vessels, peritheliomatous pattern of growth and geographic necrosis. And yet again, as I've shown several times before, you can, it's a little more subtle here, but you can again appreciate that there's hypercellularity around individual vessels. There is a vessel, there is a vessel, Here's a vessel and you can see this kind of, it's a little more vague in this case, but the cells are kind of clumping up around the vessel and then are a little bit less cellular in the intervening zones. The other reason to show this one is again, you get a sense of this kind of marbling of hypercellular and hypocellular zones, kind of hypercellular over here at the right, hypocellular out here a little bit intermingled cellularity up towards the top, and it's all swirled together. And in the hypocellular zones, again, you tend to have kind of a bluish mixoid background. It's a little bit hard to see in here because this slide's kind of faded, and the mixoid stuff fades out particularly quickly. And there also can be background collagen. And more of the uh, zonal necrosis and peritheliomatous pattern. Now here is a really good example of herringbone pattern. Sorry for all the changes in light. I, if I leave the camera to its own devices, it tends to wash out the slides. Um, so look at that, just dramatic. The fascicular growth and the fascicles kind of alternating at sharp angles those thin fascicles alternating with one another. That's a great example, really textbook example of herringbone pattern. And look where we are, skin. Now I just told you at the beginning that we don't see MPNST in skin almost never. So did I lie to you? Well, this is the exception. This is a, not a skin tumor. This was a huge deep mass in the lower leg and it was actually arising in a free flap that was performed many years ago for a, a severe injury. And we actually reported this case in the International Journal of Surge Path um, in 2017 uh, as an MPNST arising in a free flap. And this was actually a Triton tumor, which we'll talk about in a minute what that means. But uh, this example um, was a really dramatic example of the nice herringbone pattern there. You can see that MPNSTs sometimes involve the skin, but again, they're not usually gonna be small dermal or subcutaneous masses. If they get to the skin, it's because they're a huge deep mass that's pushed and, and grown up into the overlying skin, okay, most of the time. Again, there are rare exceptions, but it's really, really rare. And by far the bigger problem that I see is people wanting to diagnose MPNST in the skin way too much. They're trying to call, you know, uh, either neurofibromas with atypia, overdiagnose those as MPNST, or the biggest problem I see is that melanoma, most people have a tendency to want to call them MPNST.
right? And we'll talk in a minute, an easy way to sort that differential out. Okay, so the, this is a herringbone pattern. And um, here from the same, uh, the same case, a different slide, This one is a nice example, again, of the variability in cellularity. Hypercellular here, much less cellular here, and it's kind of swirled and intermingled together. We have some areas of kind of herringbone-esque pattern, and this one has something kind of unique. There's some, some fascicles and herringbone arrangement right here, but this particular slide has some, a unique thing that I've not shown you yet. If I can find it, here it is. What we have here is palisading kind of like you would see in the varicae bodies of a schwannoma. So, um, you know, again, these are Schwann cells and occasionally they will arrange themselves in a similar manner to other Schwannian tumors. Palisading is relatively uncommon in MPNST, but you do see it sometimes. And I feel like most of the time when you see it, it tends to be more subtle than this. This was a pretty, pretty dramatic example. And obviously this tumor is not a schwannoma. It has tons of atypia, mitotic activity, um, and as uh, many features from it that, that I would argue against schwannoma. But um, the, you know, the palisading can be a support a feature, but like I said in my schwannoma video, remember that palisading uh, can be seen a lot, a lot of different things. So not all that palisades is, um, uh, not all that palisades is schwannoma. All right. So I'm gonna put a link in the uh, video description down below to um, our paper that we published on this. And also it's, I've got a web page that has the paper there, a link to the paper, and also has um, whole slide images from this case. So you can actually see a couple examples of the H&E and some of the immunostains. So you can uh, explore the entire slide yourself um, uh, via whole slide image. So I will uh, put a link down in the video description below for that. Okay, so this was an example again of of an MPNST arising in a, fleet, a free flap. To our knowledge, the, the only time that we're aware of that happening in a free flap. Um. Now let's go back to the original thing I talked about, that there are three main scenarios where you see MPNST arise. And th these are the most helpful things more than anything else. When you have one of these settings strongly supportive of MPNST, again, assuming that you've excluded other types of sarcoma and that the that the immunostains uh, fit. Here's a nerve. This is kind of a relatively large nerve here. It's got some myxoid change in between individual nerve bundles, which is a common feature, particularly in nerves that are irritated. I feel like they, see, they show more myxoid change. Here's the nerve bundle. Starting to have an area of hypercellularity and fascicles here. There's some fascicle there. So this is starting to show where the MPNST begins. And then you can see this nerve swirls into the rest of the tumor. Now, um, in this case, the tumor is not actually here anymore. This has been treated with uh, radiation therapy and chemo preoperatively, and all that's left is this zone of wiped out death, basically, uh, uh, treatment effect. Uh, but the, so I know it's not quite as uh, dramatic as if there were actually tumor there, but you can see that the, the wiped out areas of tumor where the tumor used to be, directly growing into a nerve in, in, in a large nerve trunk. I think this was from the brachial plexus, if I recall. So um, that's one setting, right? A sarcoma that looks like MPNST arising in a nerve. That's setting number one. Number two, we've already talked about is, is uh, a set in the setting of neurofibromatosis. Or I think I made that point number three. It doesn't matter which order. And then, and then here are examples of the other scenario. What we have out here is a neurofibroma. Bland spindle cells, both a mixture of Schwann cells, fibroblasts, perineurial cells, all intermingled together haphazardly, shred, shredded carrot uh, bundles of collagen, pink collagen in the background, scattered lymphocytes. Now look, we have scattered pleomorphism here. And again, in my neurofibromatosis video, I talk about the, um, the degenerative type nuclear atypia and pleomorphism you can see in, in neurofibromas as well as other nerve sheath tumors, particularly in neurofibromas in patients with NF1, and this patient has NF1, okay? By itself, nuclear pleomorphism is not um, enough to make a diagnosis of malignant transformation of a neurofibroma, 
and the features that are, I again, I talked about in that video, and I'll put a link um, to the, there's a paper for these, uh, the setting of kind of what, what sometimes is called low-grade MPNST, or has also been termed recently atypical neurofibromatous neoplasm of uncertain biologic potential for these tumors that are kind of transitional. Um, they look more atypical than uh, neurofibroma, but they don't quite meet the criteria for MPNST. So I'll put a link to that paper. It's a really good paper. Um, uh, down in the video description below so you can read that if you're having trouble with these cases because it's a challenging area. But in this case, we're not gonna have as much trouble because the atypia by itself, again, is not enough to make a diagnosis of MPNST. But look what happens. In addition to atypia here, and look, the atypia is pretty striking. I mean, those are huge cells, but they're scattered. And in the background of the cells, the rest of the cells look totally bland. If you took these scattered, massive, ugly cells away, Everything that's left looks like a regular neurofibroma. It's not hypercellular. It's not arranged in fascicles or herringbone pattern. It doesn't have mitotic activity. All the other features here look like neurofibroma, except for these big ugly cells. So again, by themselves, this is kind of a degenerative phenomenon. But when you see these, and in the setting of a large deep neurofibroma in an NF1 patient, always look around and carefully examine the neurofibroma in that setting, um, because again, those patients are the ones who are at risk for developing uh, MPNST. So look around and see if there are other features that would, would point you towards um, MPNST. And as we, as we move from this, you can see the hypocellularity out here and haphazardness. Now we're starting to get more cellular in here and much more cellular over here. The atypical cells are there. The background cells are smaller than the, the big hyperchromatic ones, but they're much larger than the other um, cells I showed you earlier for the neurofibroma background. They're getting larger. They're arranging themselves and starting to kind of make fascicle organization, and they're getting much more cellular. And finally, as we go down here, we're beginning to see kind of the kind of a vague um, herringbone pattern. It's much more cellular than before. And most importantly, I think in this context, we don't just have scattered atypical cells. All of the cells are hyperchromatic and atypical. None of these cells look like neurofibroma anymore. They all look like atypical spindle cells. Some of them do have kind of that uh, S-shaped or buckled, curved, serpentine nuclei, wavy nuclei, if you like, so that, that are kind of evidence of a Schwannian origin, but they're all atypical. They're all much larger than the normal cells of a neurofibroma. So we have kind of diffuse atypia, hypercellularity, and mitoses here are not just scattered, but they're actually easy to find, and there are many of them. So this was an example, actually, of a, of a transformation of, of a, neuro, a neurofibroma in an NF1 patient into full high-grade MPNST, okay? So you can see that it, um, that's the transition that you're looking for. You're looking for areas like this and hypercellularity, diffuse atypia, and ideally mitotic activity to help make the diagnosis. So again, when you have something that looks like an MPNST and it's arising in the background of a neurofibroma, that helps confirm the diagnosis. That, in, in fact, that's probably the strongest confirmation. A sarcoma arising out of an obvious neurofibroma, I mean, that's basically the definition of MPNST, I think, or one of the, one of the core definitions. Here's another example of a nerve. You can see this is a nerve that's a large nerve. Let's see if I can get the light right here. Probably not. This is a large nerve. Uh, that capsule around the outside is kind of a thickened perineurium. And the nerve itself is replaced, basically, by neurofibroma. This is kind of the neurofibroma uh, filling up the nerve. And I think this was part of a, a diffuse and plexiform neurofibroma. Here, ah, see, here's an area where the neurofibroma has spilled out into the adjacent adipose tissue. And look at that. It's like the best example of Wagner-Meissner bodies I've ever seen. And again, I talk about that in the neurofibroma video. This is a really useful sign, Wagner-Meissner bodies or pseudo meissnerian structures, um, a really useful sign for um, a diagnosis of diffuse neurofibroma. And uh, small diffuse neurofibromas can occur uh, sporadically in people, but when they, these occur in the setting of NF1, and they're, especially when they're large and get deeper, sometimes MPNST can develop out of those. And look, you can see this kind of, these kind of plate-like strands of collagen stacking up, and then the Schwann cells kind of lining up around the outside. I feel like these are almost like kind of a form, an unusual form of palisading that, that mimics um, Meissner um, 
mice and their corpuscles that are the fine touch receptors in the skin. A really a very beautiful pattern, I think, for such a, for such a terrible disease as a neurofibromatosis. So in pathology, we constantly have that struggle of what we see under the microscope being, being visually appealing and beautiful and fascinating scientifically, and on the other end, knowing that the patients are suffering. And that's the, the strange paradox we have in pathology, that the things that fascinate us are hurting people. So I feel like um, putting my fascination and interest to good use to do the best I can at being a pathologist to help uh, sick patients is, um, is the most important thing I can do with that, that interest. And that's what I'm trying to do here with these videos. And you can see here again, this is getting more cellular. And now the neurofibroma growing out of a nerve, hypercellular, herringbone fascicles, mitoses, all the stuff we've talked about. This is an MPNST growing out of a neurofibroma and growing out of a nerve at the same time. And I think over here there's more, this is more of the diffuse neurofibroma in the background. And you can see this area looks like bland spindle cells, haphazardly arranged and uh, infiltrating into the fat. So, Now here's an MPNST that looks a little different. It's, this one actually has kind of more rounded or angulated cells, not really the elongated spindle cells we've been showing a little, well, this, I guess I picked the wrong area. That area does look a little spindled still. But there are plenty of areas here that are kind of more, almost round blue in a way, and kind of angulated. And um, there's lots of hemorrhage, which is another feature you can see in MPNST, and lots of necrosis, geographic necrosis, perivascular accentuation of enlarged atypical cells. And what do we have right next to this tumor? Big nodule of neurofibroma. Another big nodule, these are expanding a distorted nerve. This was part of a, of a plexiform neurofibroma um, on imaging. And this was the plexiform neurofibroma and right here next to it, high grade MPNST. All right, and here's one other example. This one really looks uh, like a round blue cell tumor in a way. I mean, these are like not small round blue cells, but large round blue cells in sheets, almost you could argue maybe epithelioid. And they're, this one has an unusual growth pattern. It's multiple nodules of high grade round blue cells. There's more nodules up here, zonal necrosis over here. And all of this is growing in the background of diffuse neurofibroma. Here's the neurofibroma right here. Here's more of it over here. So this is the diffuse neurofibroma, and then right in the midst of it, high-grade malignant round cells with necrosis, MPNST. All right, now let me show you um, some immunostains. Remember this case we talked about a minute ago? Here's the case again. This is the one that we had that was uh, an MPNST arising in a free flap um, on the leg and it had the hyper and hypocellular areas. I'm gonna show you what this looked like on immunohistochemistry now. Okay, so here's that same case, the same section of tissue, and this is the S100 stain. Take a look at this, this is the control, probably a piece of metastatic melanoma from a different case used to prove that the stain worked. Diffuse, strong intensity staining of the nucleus and the cytoplasm, okay? That's how the stain normally stains um, uh, like a schwannoma or a melanoma, okay? Now let's look what it's doing in this tumor. You can see there's an area of staining here that seems kind of intense, but this intensity diminishes and eventually trickles away and what's left is most of the tumor is completely negative. Here are some background adipocytes that are entrapped in the tumor that have uh, staining of their cell membrane. Here's fascicles of atypical spindle cells, completely negative. There's a few little dendritic cells in the background, which are not tumor cells. So look over here at the stain, the area of intense staining. This is actually a little bit more intense than you usually see in MPNST. Like I mentioned earlier, I think uh, about half of the cases of MPNST are completely negative for S100 or SOX10. And the other half will show often this patchy, kind of weaker staining. And this is a little bit stronger than I usually see, but what really helps here is that when you look closer at the strong areas, 
actually, even though all the cells are atypical uh, tumor cells, these are not. This is not like a neurofibroma. This is all diffuse fascicles of atypical mitotically active tumor cells. What you can see is some of the cells are staining strongly, but there are intermediate intervening cells that have kind of a weaker staining pattern, and some that are even completely negative yet are fully um, atypical cytologically. So we have this kind of um, mixed population with with regards to S100 staining. And as we go from the uh, more intense kind of central areas here out towards the periphery, you can see that fewer and fewer cells are staining and they're staining weaker and weaker until we're eventually out here and the rest of the tumor is completely dead negative for S100. So with the fact that this tumor had really classic histologic features of MPNST and that there is S100 staining, but it's only in a subset of cells and it's patchy, even though it's a little stronger than usual, um, that's a really supportive feature of this being an MPNST. And furthermore, in this case, there were actually rhabdomyoblasts scattered around. So this was a malignant triton tumor, which we'll talk about in a second. And there were rhabdomyoblasts found on um, desmond and myogenin immunostains, which is, uh, again, in this histologic um, um, uh, pattern, and in this context, when you see rhabdomyoblasts, it's strongly supportive of an MPNST. So I think this is a great example, actually, of how when you have S100 staining, uh, usually most of the areas are going to be weaker, and it's going to be patchy, and you're going to have zones with complete loss of S100 staining. Um, and all of those features are going to, the fact that you have some patchy S100 helps to prove that there probably is neural differentiation here, but the fact that it's weak or diminished or patchy helps uh, fit with the diagnosis of MPNST. And I find that a lot of pathologists really struggle with accepting this concept that MPNST, even though it's a nerve sheath tumor, doesn't usually have strong diffuse S100 staining. And I think the way that we know that, you know, people say, well, how do we know it's neural then? The reason is that when we see MPNSTs arising out of a neurofibroma in a patient with NF1, this is what usually we see, complete loss. A lot of times the background neurofibroma will stain strongly with S100. And then as you transition into the cellular atypical areas that represent high grade MPNST adjacent to it, you'll see loss, either partial or complete loss of S100. So in those settings where we know that the tumor must be malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor because of the context it's arising in, we see that S100 is usually not strongly and diffusely positive. It's usually patchy negative or, or patchy weak um, and not strong and diffuse. So I think that's really helpful. And again, the problem is that I see people, they'll send in spindle cell tumors that are diffusely strongly S100 positive, and they'll think it's an MPNST. And usually when those are in the skin, they end up being spindle cell melanoma. Uh, occasionally, um, you can see atypical change in um, degenerative atypia in neurofibromas, and people will overly worry about that and interpret that by itself as being MPNST, which is, again, uh, the topic I addressed in the neurofibroma video I made recently. And then also sometimes schwannomas can be very cellular and have um, some atypical features. And that's a topic we'll have to make a whole separate video about because it's very challenging. Uh, cellular schwannoma can be a very challenging mimic of MPNST. And it usually will have diffuse strong S100, which is one feature that helps you to sort those two things out. And then uh, at the end of the video, we'll talk briefly about epithelioid MPNST. And it's the one exception to this rule I'm telling you about S100 that it usually has diffuse strong S100 staining and it can easily mimic a me metastatic melanoma because cause of that. Um, and I, um, I can't remember if I mentioned it earlier in the video, but I, I have at least one colleague who's told me, who's a soft tissue pathologist, and has mentioned that, that he's seen several cases now that were definitely MPNST, but did have strong diffuse S100. So he suspects that maybe um, the clone sensitivity of the clones being used in S100 may be changing with time, and maybe the old rule that I'm teaching you about S100 often being negative, maybe we shouldn't uh, accept that dogmatically. And he may be right, but in my experience, I still have not seen very very many MPNSTs with strong diffuse S100 staining. And if you see that, I think you should be very wary and probably uh, get some expert guidance before making that diagnosis. Now let me show you a different case here, um, which illustrates some of the same concepts and some additional immunostains as well. Okay, so I'm gonna show an example here that's got a few of the features we've discussed and you can see we have sheets of hyperchromatic cells here from low power, uh, foci of hemorrhage, lots of necrosis. Look at this zonal necrosis right here. Kind of a, a big sea of, of necrotic pink debris. Get the light adjusted. We've got more hemorrhage and necrosis here. And this kind of uh, a, a geographic necrosis again is really common in a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor.
All right, let's go to higher power. And this, uh, this particular example doesn't have as much of that herringbone fascicular pattern. Cells here are much more kind of round, large and round in this tumor, but it's got a couple other features that I think are helpful. So here's, here's one thing I wanna point out. Uh, look, look what's happening right here. Here we've got a blood vessel, and you can see from kind of, uh, I think we're on the 4X objective here, you can see there's kind of this enhancement or clustering of cells around the vessel. Let's go in closer. See, look, you got, you got a little bit of spindled, kind of almost fascicular growth out here. And then look at that transition over towards the right of the screen. You can see as it gets around that vessel. Sorry, having a little trouble with the lighting. There we go. Look around the vessel here. You can see that the cells, they get larger, they get more rounded, almost kind of plump and epithelioid even, and they kind of cluster and uh, coalesce around that vessel. And this is a really a common finding in MPNST, and it's a finding that I feel I've seen not very often in other sarcomas. So whenever I see this, I really stop and give thought to the idea of something being an MPNST. Look here. See how large and atypical and kind of plump the cells get right around the vessel as opposed to further away from the vessel. And this is not the only vessel with that change in this, this particular tumor here. Let me find another example. Here's, here's a little bit more. And again, you can see just right around the edge of this vessel, the cells get particularly large and atypical kind of right around the edge. And sometimes you have changes in the endothelial cells as well, but not always. And I think you can see more of it right there around those vessels, kind of this unusual clustering or coalescing. Here's some around this vessel right here. It's a very unusual and distinct uh, feature. All right, so we pointed out the geographic necrosis, this unusual um, enhancement, perivascular enhancement with enlargement um, of cells and more prominent um, atypia, larger cells. And here, oh, here's again, more of it. All right. And there, I think that vessel actually shows it really nicely. It's a very, a very good example of the changes that kind of large plump cells around vessels. Okay, so that's the one feature I wanted to point out. And then here's the other thing, is that in this tumor, uh, let's see if I can find the area, I hope so. There are occasional cells like this. This one's like a monster cell, it's huge. But look at its cytoplasm. It's got abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. So when we see this in um, MPNST, I always think about triton tumor, malignant triton tumor, which is, again, MPNST with heterologous rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. So cells like this look like they could be rhabdomyoblasts. And sometimes they're very focal. Sometimes you can actually can't really appreciate them on the H&E and can only uh, appreciate them when you do immunostains. Uh, but other times you have really big ones like that, and I've seen a few that they were just very, very prominent and abundant throughout the tumor and might make you even consider like a rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, here's another one where we're seeing a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm here. We can't really see the nucleus of that particular cell. But when I start seeing that eosinophilic fibrillary cytoplasm around, um, it starts making me suspicious for the possibility of triton tumor differentiation. And while we're on this subject, let me point out a potential pitfall here. In this case, let's see if I can find the area again. Look out here to the periphery of the tumor. This is atrophic skeletal muscle, and you can see how the cells are arranged in big fascicles, bundles of muscle. And when you go to higher power, you can see that they look like normal, mature skeletal muscle, just smaller. So they're undergoing atrophy, breaking down the proteins um, in their cytoplasm and getting smaller. And they still have multiple nuclei, which tend to be peripheral, but as the cells get atrophic and shrink, the nuclei kind of move towards the center. And if we go over right next to the tumor, we can see that there's still atrophic skeletal muscle Right here, this bundles, I don't know if it's showing up very well on the screen. 
there's a kind of a fascicle of atrophic skeletal muscle in here and look what happens. Some of it's getting trapped up at the very periphery of the tumor, okay? Look at the nuclei of this multinucleated atrophic skeletal muscle cell and compare it to its massively atypical neighbors. So this is just a trapped atrophic skeletal muscle cell. And look, there's several others right next to it. So atrophic skeletal muscle usually um, doesn't, doesn't sit by itself with nothing else. It usually is in a group with other skeletal muscle fibers because they were part of a pre-existing uh, muscle bundle that's become atrophic and gotten entrapped. Um, and usually they have small nuclei. Sometimes the nuclei get very dark and hyperchromatic and small and can overlap each other and look like pleomorphism. And then in other cases like this, you can sometimes get this change, which I suspect is kind of the muscle trying to repair itself, like turning on its nuclei, because you get those, those clustered nuclei there, that's part of an atrophic skeletal muscle um, fiber. And, uh, the, and I've seen that many times in settings where it clearly is you know, not even a tumor. So that's kind of how, by studying the, the changes that you can see in reactive processes like atrophic skeletal muscle in um, non-neoplastic settings where you know it's not a sarcoma, for example, then that's really helpful when you're looking at a sarcoma case and you can say, oh yeah, I remember I've seen skeletal muscle look just like that in that uh, other case where it was, you know, reactive changes around a post-surgical site or something else. All right, so that is also a muscle bundle, so the, or a muscle fiber. So the point is, is near the periphery of a tumor, especially if you have atrophic skeletal muscle um, uh, fibers right next to the tumor, uh, always consider that the, the uh, things that look like rhabdomyoblasts at the periphery or right next to other skeletal muscle, especially if you can track up and look, kind of move back and look and say, well, that stuff looks worrisome. But as you move back, oh, look, there's stuff there that clearly is skeletal muscle. And if you go down, you can find striations usually. Um, then if you should really be careful to make sure that you're not over-interpreting atrophic skeletal muscle as uh, rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Okay, so but out here, we're way out in the middle of the tumor and we've got these markedly atypical cells with uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm, then uh, that's a different story. So in any case, let's look at some immunostains on this case. First, let's look at S100. And even adjusting the light, it's hard to get this on the screen because it's, it's completely negative. The only staining we have is over here We've got a little bit of background mature adipocytes, which sometimes express S100 on their membranes. So there's our internal control to prove the stain worked. And in the midst of the tumor, look, the nuclei and cytoplasm dead negative. The only thing we see are occasional scattered positive cells. Now these cells are not tumor cells, okay? It's real important. Scattered um, cells that are positive for S100 are usually either Langerhans cells or other dendritic cells. And in fact, I feel that they're a useful internal control. If I don't see any of those in an entire tumor uh, slice, uh, an entire section of S100, then I get really suspicious that maybe the S100 stain failed or didn't work appropriately. Especially in the skin or in really inflamed tumors, these these cells tend to be quite abundant, but I think anywhere, if I don't see any S100 staining in dendritic cells, I get worried and I go look and see if there's a nerve nearby or maybe some fat to help prove that the stain really did work, okay? But don't say that this is focal positivity. It's not. These are just dendritic cells in the background um, uh, uh, reacting to the tumor, okay? So the tumor cells are negative, and remember that's what we said, that S100 is 50% of the time negative in MPNST, and the other 50% of the time patchy or, or kind of weak positive. All right, here's an additional stain that we uh, mentioned earlier, and this is the uh, stain for H3K27ME3, all right, a histone methylating protein, and it's positive usually in, in normal cells and in most tumors, but is lost in malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, in many of them at least. And you can see here these background vessels, the endothelial cells are retaining the stain, and sometimes I find that not all the background cells uh, stain perfectly, but it's important to find at least some that are, are normal cells that are staining. Um, and you can see right around here, around this vessel, but then the tumor nuclei themselves are completely negative. They've lost the stain. So this is one of those few stains in pathology where loss of nuclear expression actually ha is the meaningful finding. And again, it's not totally specific for MPNST. It's been described in some other entities, but I find it as a helpful extra point, an extra star in the constellation of features that uh, help us make a diagnosis of MPNST. Uh, so here we've already pointed out some of the H&E features, but now we've got negative S100. We've got loss of uh, H3K27ME3. And so that's helpful. And in this particular case, uh, we did uh, staining for desmin and myogenin to help see if it was indeed a triton tumor, and it is.
you can see this is Desmond and let's look Look at the periphery here. Here you can really nicely see the skeletal muscle bundles highlighted, the atrophic skeletal muscle at the periphery. And you can see some of those larger cells there are entrapped. See how they're organized right here? Just like a bundle, it's just a bundle that's been overrun by tumor cells. A lot of the cells in between that are the kind of uh, blank spaces in here, those are actually filled with tumor cells. But you can see that this pattern right here, this used to be a fascicle just like its neighbor right here, okay? So this is the pattern of tumor entrapping um, atrophic skeletal muscle. But when we go out into the midst of the tumor, see again, there's more skeletal muscle kind of trapped in a, in a septum between uh, tumor lobules. But look out here. Here we've got obvious tumor cells that are staining. And the pattern of staining is different. It's kind of this globular, sometimes dot-like staining. If we go closer and look at the nuclei, we can see that these are truly the atypical tumor cells that are staining here. So this is, this is supportive of rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. And further support is accomplished by doing a myogenin or MYF MIF4. Let's see if we can get this from low power to show the extent. Look at that. Numerous tumor cells are positive. And take a second and look out here. This is the atrophic muscle we just looked at on the Desmond. Look at that, almost completely negative. So mature skeletal muscle is not usually going to stain with nuclear myogenin. That said, occasionally atrophic muscle fibers or muscle fibers that are injured and kind of regenerating, I, I suspect that they turn on the genes that regulate muscle uh, development and myogenin is one of those genes. I don't know that's for sure, but this is kind of my suspicion. Um, I'm not a cell biologist, so there are people out there I'm sure much more knowledgeable than me. But look, there are some multinucleated atrophic skeletal muscle cells that do have nuclear myogenin. So that's important. I've occasionally seen that before where an entrapped atrophic skeletal muscle fiber in a, in a non-rhabdomyoblastic tumor um, or not, not in the setting of Triton tumor where it had some positivity and that caused confusion diagnostically. So do keep in mind that that can happen. Okay, we've got a couple of, the, of those cells out here, but most of the cells are negative. Most of the atrophic muscle is negative. And then once we move into the tumor, numerous cells are positive out here. And going back to, look at that, look how many cells are positive. It's not always this uh, florid. Sometimes it is only scattered cells in the midst of the tumor. Um, but here we've got obvious large atypical nuclei, all of, or many of which are staining with nuclear myogenin. And remember, myogenin is a nuclear stain, not a cytoplasmic stain. Um, in my hands and in the, the labs I've seen it from, it usually is clean and has a nice nuclear stain with little, uh, very little background stain. So that's why I like myogenin. And myo-D1, on the other hand, is also a nuclear marker of a, a, a skeletal muscle transcription factor. And while it does work, I find that it often has high background cytoplasmic staining, which makes it difficult to interpret. So I don't personally like to use myo uh, myo D1 most of the time, I, I like myogenin. So this is just an example of how you can use immunohistochemistry to help support a diagnosis of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And in this case, it was a uh, Triton tumor with heterologous rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. Okay, now let's, now that we've discussed the immunostains, let's go and look at a, in two different variants of MPNST that are worth bringing up, okay? Ignore the blue dots for a second there so that I can find the feature I'm gonna show you. Here's a high-grade tumor on the lower leg, and that you can see ge geographic necrosis already. Closer look, look at the herringbone fascicles, all the features we've talked about, all right? Now let's go to the dots. Let me see if I can get this to show up on the video. When I tested it, it worked. Look at these cells right here with the bright pink eosinophilic cytoplasm, okay? So when you see cells like this in an MPNST, what you have to think about is triton tumor, malignant triton tumor, which is basically an MPNST that has divergent or what we call heterologous differentiation into rhabdomyoblastic cells. So you'll have variable amounts of rhabdomyoblast present in the midst of an otherwise usual MPNST, okay? Now, pink cells by themselves are not always rhabdomyoblasts, so you can use immunohistochemistry like we just showed, uh, desmin and myogenin, uh, to help confirm this. But in some cases, when you get lucky, you can actually see striations.
skeletal muscle striations. I'm hoping this is showing up on the video, but see right here, this guy. Look at those little zebra stripes that he has. I mean, I don't know it's a he, but that is a rhabdomyoblast that's actually making organized um, um, contractile proteins that are organizing into striations. So the rhabdomyoblasts in Triton tumor, in MPNST with rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, these rhabdomyoblasts are like too good to be true. They're too perfect to, they're way more rhabdomyoblastic than you actually see in rhabdomyosarcomas. And I think that one theory that I've, I've read about this is that, that the, these rhabdomyoblasts are more differentiated. They are more like normal adult, uh, kind of further along the line embryologically towards normal adult skeletal muscle, and that's why they're actually making striations. Whereas in rhabdomyosarcoma, the rhabdomyoblasts, they are very primitive actually, and um, even though they have contractile proteins in their cytoplasm, they're kind of just swirled around and they're not organized into, um, into contractile elements and Z lines and the, the, the striations that you see here. So um, this is a, a relatively infrequent to see this, but when you see it, it's really dramatic sometimes, and this is a good example. And I think my other dots show um, some other areas like that. Let's see if I can bring them into focus here. Yeah, this area actually had a, a particular abundance of these uh, pink cells. Sometimes the pink cells are kind of rounded and epithelioid, and sometimes they're elongated and kind of like similar to the strap cells that you'll see like in embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, these long um, stretched out cells with, with uh, elongated pink cytoplasm. And then again, the striations are present sometimes uh, focally. I think in this area there was another one. Oh yeah, there it is. So sometimes flipping the condenser can help to, to bring out the, um, any refractile structure, um, any structure that's kind of linear um, in cells. So you can see again the little stripes of uh, striation here, confirming that these are rhabdomyoblasts. And this tumor stained with desmin and myogenin, of course. Um, and sometimes you can't actually see the Triton cells there. Um, the, on H&E, they just look like any other MPNST. So I find that actually using Desmin as a screening tool when I think something is um, an MPNST is really, is really helpful. See like here, I've got herringbone fascicles and I have other features that I showed you that look like MPNST. So if I was debating, is this a real MPNST or not? Say the patient didn't have NF1, there's no neurofibroma, no nerve. Well, one thing I could do is S100 and make sure the S100 is either weak, patchy, or negative. Um, again, strong, diffuse S100 is unusual in most MPNST, and um, usually a strong argument against it. And then if I see a tumor that histologically, morphologically looks like MPNST and then has scattered rhabdomyoblasts either on H&E and or on immunostains, to me that's really supportive because most rhabdomyosarcomas are not gonna grow with a pattern that resembles MPNST. So if it looks like MPNST, it's an adult, and there are rhabdomyoblasts present, to me that's a very strong supporting feature to support a diagnosis of a true MPNST and uh, with rhabdomyoblastic heterologous differentiation. So this heterologous rhabdomyosarcomatous uh, or rhabdomyoblastic component is present in about 15% of MPNSTs. I certainly uh, see it actually on a relatively regular basis. Um, it n almost never as dramatic as this case I'm showing you here, but it, they are, rhabdomyoblasts are present oftentimes, or in a significant subset, excuse me, about 15%. And the reason I bring it up is A, it, it can really help you confirm the diagnosis like I just stated, and also if you're not aware of it, and you do see rhabdomyoblasts, you could really struggle with wondering, is this a rhabdomyosarcoma? And that could potentially raise other treatment implications for the patient, okay? So, and plus it's just a curiosity and an unusual name. The name, by the way, doesn't derive from like the, the god of the sea in mythology, but actually from the Triton salamander. And I don't know the full story, but, but my basic understanding is when you cut the tail off of a Triton salamander, I don't know why anyone would do that. But if you do, they can regrow their tail and the neural and skeletal muscle elements intermingle together. And so for a, a long time ago, there was a thought that, that that maybe was what was happening here in Triton tumor, that you were kind of having this uh, growth of two different cells populations but now I think we understand that tumors arise from some sort of precursor stem cell and then they can differentiate along different lines and again I'm not a cell biologist there's probably so much more complexity there than I understand here's an MPNST and this has got a treatment effect a lot of hemosiderin and necrosis from being treated here's another example where you actually can have some palisading sometimes
So this one did have palisading, kind of this funny rows and bands and um, of, of palisaded um, uh, atypical spindle cells. But the reason I'm showing it is because this one also had rhabdomyoblasts. Oh, and here's more palisading there. Well, somewhere up here. Ah, there. And this area actually gets herringbone and fascicular. You can see fascicular hyperchromatic atypical spindle cells like the other MPNSTs and look these big, huge epithelioid cells with the eosinophilic cytoplasm. This is the kind of rhabdomyoblast that I feel I see more often than those strap-like striated ones. Again, they're not always quite so big or quite so obvious. They could really mimic entrapped uh, skeletal muscle, like in that case I showed you earlier with the immunostains. But the thing that's kind of helpful here is they usually have one or maybe a couple more centrally located nuclei, and they will not have um, adjacent atrophic skeletal muscle uh, arranged in a bundle. And if we flip the condenser, what we can see is this, it's a little subtle, but the cytoplasm has little wispy, stri not striations, little stringy wisps of filamentous cytoplasm. So that it's because the cytoplasm is filled with contractile filaments. If you do a Desmond stain, you'll see that there's Desmond filling up this cytoplasm. But here they're not arranged into, uh, arranged with other uh, proteins to make the nice uh, linear striations like we saw in that previous case. Here they're kind of swirled around and almost, I hate to use the word tissue paper because I know that that's a buzzword for other diseases, but it kind of looks like a fine crinkly sort of paper to me. Um, you'll have to see what visual works with you, but this kind of wispy, swirly cytoplasm in these big eosinophilic cells, that's a good feature to make you think of rhabdomyoblasts, both in the setting of MPNST and in some other types of rhabdomyosarcoma. So big pink cells, particularly if they have a fibrillary kind of uh, wispy cytoplasm, consider the possibility of rhabdomyoblasts there. Here are more. Right here, you can see them there, these large eosinophilic cells. There are more of them here. This one had quite a few uh, rhabdomyoblasts. And now, and here again closer. And that's a better look, I think, at that cytoplasm, this kind of very fine fibrillary swirling cytoplasm in this cell right here. To me, that burn that into your mind. That's what you should think of. Don't go expecting to see striations and rhabdomyoblasts because most of the time you'll be disappointed. I feel like rhabdomyoblasts more often have cytoplasm like this than striated cytoplasm. All right, so another example of malignant triton tumor. And again, for treatment purposes, I don't think there's any difference, although, the, again, the WHO mentions that the prognosis or the behavior may be even more aggressive for, uh, for triton tumor. Um, but I believe that they should be treated the same in general. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about is this entity. And this is epithelioid MPNST. It's important for a couple reasons. Number one, it looks epithelioid and it can mimic other types of epithelioid tumors, either poorly differentiated carcinomas or other types of sarcomas that have epithelioid morphology. So it's important to know about it, okay? This one had, had this uh, kind of an unusual look, dramatic, um, striking perivascular accentuation by epithelioid atypical cells large, round cells with abundant cytoplasm, round nuclei. A lot of times they have prominent nucleoli and they're kind of arranged here strikingly around the vessels. In the background in other areas, you could see more spindled fascicular growth, kind of, kind of similar to um, other types of MPNST, but there really were abundant um, epithelioid areas in this case. And you can see around each of the vessels. Let's see if the condenser shows the pattern a little better. I think it does there. You can see this striking perivascular accentuation of really epithelioid cells. And the reason that this is also important, aside from the histologic confusion it might cause, is that epithelioid MPNSTs have one major difference immunohistochemically from the, M the conventional MPNSTs. They often strongly express S100 or SOX10. Okay, so I've been telling you this whole video, don't, you know, S100 should be negative or should be weak, although I can't remember if I mentioned earlier, but uh, uh, at least one colleague of mine has said they've seen a few examples, at least of MPNST conventional type that did have strong S100. So exceptions exist and, and um, uh, maybe, maybe the clones are changing or something. But in my experience, I still feel like most MPNST I see are either dead negative or weak patchy positive with the exception of epithelioid MPNST. So these will be strong, diffuse S100 SOX10 positive usually, and the reason that's important is when you have epithelioid, very atypical cells, and you've got strong S100, the first thing you're going to think of is melanoma. 
as you should. So how do you tell this apart from melanoma? Well, one thing you can do melanoma markers like MART1 and HMB45, which obviously should be negative in, um, in epithelioid MPNST. And um, I've heard reports of people saying that you can sometimes have focally positive markers. I have a bit of a hard time accepting that. But anyway, I, I would say to be extremely cautious about ever calling something MPNST if it has MART1 or HMB45. If you really want to do that, I would probably recommend getting an expert consult first. That would be something I would feel very uncomfortable as a soft tissue pathologist making that diagnosis. So here, S100 strong diffuse positive, but MART and HMB negative. Well, that's one point against melanoma. But we can see melanomas, like I mentioned earlier, that lose expression of the specific markers. Okay, well, the next thing is the clinical setting. Is this a large, deep mass arising in a nerve or um, in a patient with NF1? Well, epithelial MPNSTs don't tend to be associated with NF1, actually. So that rule doesn't really help us as much. And it's, even though I've mentioned in my schwannoma video that schwannoma is rare, it's very rare to have malignant transformation, when they do turn into sarcoma, the type of uh, sarcoma they often turn into is epithelioid form of MPNST. So again, it's just, these are maybe 5% of all MPNSTs, a really uncommon subset of MPNST. And, um, and schwannomas that develop MPNST is super rare, way, way lower than that. But when they do it, they often will be epithelioid. So a lot of the tricks and tips that help us normally tell apart MPNST from melanoma are a lot harder to use here because we've got diffuse S100, we have an epithelioid morphology that looks like um, melanoma and um, and we can't use some of the usual tricks so I think one thing that particularly um, is helpful here though is if it's a large deep mass particularly if it's arising in uh, or near a nerve um, either on imaging or clinically and also the patient has no history of melanoma now we do see I'm also a dermatopathologist and I see metastases of melanoma where the patient has no known primary on a a relatively regular basis. It's not common, but in our setting where we see lots of melanomas in my practice, I do see it, you know, every every couple months maybe. So it certainly happens, but it is a little unusual to have one large deep mass and no history and no other mets anywhere else. That's a little strange, okay? Um, so that's, that's a, a point that you can consider there um, as well. And you could also potentially try BRAF testing. I can't remember actually if BRAF has been uh, found in MPNST. It's certainly possible. I mean, it's been found in lots of other tumors, uh, but I, I know most sarcomas tend to be BRAF uh, negative or non-mutated. So BRAF mutation would be a point towards making me think about a melanoma actually in this setting. And uh, in this case though, I think one of the helpful things is it did have background areas that looked more like, more spindled, more herringbone, and began to look a little bit more, and I can't find the area, but it had some areas that looked a little bit more like conventional MPNST. But these, I think, can be quite challenging, and particularly if you think it's an epithelial MPNST and it's small and superficial, be very careful. It's much more likely to be a cutaneous metastasis of melanoma, maybe a clear cell sarcoma of soft parts, um, or the one other thing um, is epithelial schwannoma. And epithelial schwannoma, as I mentioned in the schwannoma video, they can be atypical and they can have mitosis. And I was a co-author on a paper with Drs. Hart and Edgar and Weiss, where we looked at atypical um, epithelial schwannomas and found that even when they had pretty striking atypical features, they had a good behavior. And other people have argued that, you know, it's kind of debatable sometimes in the really atypical ones, how to tell them apart from epithelial MPNST. But I think in our paper, one of the biggest things that helped is if it's small and superficial and it looks really good for an epithelioid schwannoma, then it's much more likely to be that even if it has atypia. Whereas if it's large and deep and really atypical, um, then you got to really worry about an epithelioid MPNST. But this is an extremely challenging area. And the main reason I bring it up is that it's easy to mistake these as a melanoma and um, sorting them out can be pretty challenging. Here's one other example. And I think this was, this was a large mass coming off of a spinal nerve root, okay? And the patient had no history of melanoma. And S100 was strongly positive and all the other markers were negative. And this is, to me, this is the really, really classic area here. We've got this kind of multi-nodularity of these round epithelioid cells and they're kind of arranged in clusters, like big nodules and then little clusters within. And again, this is, this is kind of similar to the pattern you see in epithelioid schwannoma. So that's why it can be challenging to tell epithelial MPNST and epithelial schwannoma apart. But here we have a large deep mass coming off the spinal nerve root, lots of mitotic activity, had areas of necrosis, had other areas of the tumor that looked more sheet-like and, and like a high-grade sarcoma, like over here. I mean, these areas look really bad, really atypical, very high-grade. 
So those things are important, but again, the main reason to bring this up is that this is one exception to the rule, and epithelioid MPNSTs will often, usually even, have strong diffuse S100 and SOX10, and so it's really important to kind of, in, in my mind, I separate them apart as almost a different kind of entity because they don't occur in the setting of NF1 usually, they have a different staining pattern, they look different, and the differential diagnosis is different, right? Um, here you could easily get confused with melanoma. But in conventional MPNST, even though melanoma sometimes can get spindled fascicular growth, like spindle cell melanomas, if it's on the scalp of an old person that's sun damaged and it's S100 positive, it is not going to be an MPNST. Just, I can tell you right now, I'd bet a million bucks against it. It's almost always going to be a melanoma. Now, I'm, someone's going to call me in a few years and say that I owe them a million bucks because they found one. So, so uh, I'm just joking. And I don't, I'm not going to give anyone a million bucks. I don't have it. But anyway, I hope that this at least helps you have a better concept of all the different findings we can see in MPNST, the immunostains, and the unusual variants of Triton tumor and epithelial MPNST. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please click like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And please leave comments or questions uh, down below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for watching.